Good afternoon. We're live here at Italian Roots and Genealogy. I'm special host Phil Apollo here with uh, the main host, Bob Sorrentino. Uh, we're here to ask Bob a couple questions. Say, hey, how are you doing today, Bob? I'm doing great, Phil. Thanks a lot for doing the interview. Oh, you're welcome. No problem. Anytime. We're, we're here to discuss a book you wrote, um, Farmers and Nobles. Can you enlighten us and tell us why uh, you uh, specifically titled the book? Farmers and Nobles? Yeah, sure. So it's based on my two Italian families, my grandparents that both came from Italy. And uh, my mom's family were farmers from Torito, Bari. And my dad's family, his mom, his father rather, was from, a, I guess, a gentrified family. They were lawyers and pharmacists. And my grandmother was from two noble families. How did your, your parents? Eventually, they both wound up in Corona, Queens. Um, and I'm not exactly sure you know, when and how they met, but both families found their way there. There was an Italian enclave back in Queens in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And like, I guess, virtually all the Italians in Corona, Queens, they got married at St. Leo's. And that was the mainstay growing up, was Corona, Queens. And if, if you know the um, uh, King of Queens, and there's a, there's a shot where he walks away from the lemon ice king and the, the ice falls on the floor. Yeah. That was about five blocks from my grandmother's house. Oh, wow. Real close. That's a, that's a pretty little interesting tidbit. Yeah. Your parents then met here in the USA. Um, how about your, your father's parents? Did they meet here in the USA or did they meet back home in uh, Italy? Because you, uh, you mentioned how your father's male line was from a gentrified line and your mother's line was from two noble families. So I, I'm curious to, to know is how they, do they just meet here by chance or was it something arranged? My father's parents were, you know, one side was gentrified and my grandmother was from the noble families. And um, I always heard the story growing up, quite funny story, that my grandfather would say that he was in seminary studying to be a priest. And he would say that my grandmother would pass the seminary and flirt with him. I found out years later from my second cousin, who's, uh, whose mom was very close to my grandmother growing up because she was the oldest, uh, the oldest granddaughter. She said that my grandmother was in her fancy schmancy carriage one day and it broke down in front of the seminary. My grandfather was outside. He helped repair the carriage. And that was it. If the carriage didn't break down, I wouldn't be here. Oh, wow. That's, that's a very interesting story. You know, sometimes you got to think, uh, you know, mechanical failures or, you know, things like that that just happen and just brings people together and just, and just creates just the best stories, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's a funny story. Now, you know, on, on the converse, my, uh, and that's why we come up with the far Farmers and Nobles, my mom's family, they were farmers from Torito as far back as, you know, anybody knows. Okay, so, you know, um, you, you mentioned as far back as anyone knows. Now, did you do any sort of uh, tracing on the side of the family that was farmers, whether... Uh, you know, tracing here in the United States or tracing all the way back into Italy? Yeah, so I was able to trace back. And surprisingly, um, the Antonati, uh, Torito has thousands of records on the Antonati. I was very surprised by that because it's such a small place. And so I was able to get back uh, several generations, back to, I guess, the earliest birth date. It was around 750 I'm sorry, 1750, something like that. So, and, and I've probably gathered over 150 records of, you know, great aunts, great uncles, grandparents, you know, cousins and things like that. Now, do you have any, like, per, any interesting stories in particular to share with us about your family on your mom's side of the family back in Italy or even here in the, the United States? Well, back in Italy... Uh, there are two stories that I have. One is from in the book, and it's, it's quite a nice story that before my oldest uncle passed away, my cousin recorded him in Bades, and he didn't leave Italy with his family until 1950. 
So he gives the whole account from the earliest he remembers through World War II and, and coming here. My great-grandfather, he owned a cow. They actually owned a house, which is surprising in that they owned a house. But he owned a cow, and he was apparently the village milkman. He would walk through the village with my uncle, and if you wanted milk, he'd stop in front of the door and fill up a pail, and <laughs> that's how they got the milk. And um, I also have the story from my oldest cousin, from my Uncle Giovanni, and she was probably about, I guess about uh, eight or nine when World War II broke out. So she tells a story of what it was like during the war, uh, and uh, she actually remembered my great-grandfather. So it's a bit of history. And, and again, you know, that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. People need to get these stories, write them down, whether they publish them or not. You know, that's up to them. But they need to save these stories for future generations. Yeah, I, I definitely agree, especially when you have a, a firsthand account of, you know, like, war, you know, people going through like hard times such as, you know, war or, you know, uh, even economic downturns or things like that it's it's important to have that information just so we can understand what went on in their daily life whether it's our connection to our past and our particular family and the struggles that they faced along the way or just you know the struggles of you know a any people you know in particular without any particularity yeah and that's what was so interesting about getting these stories and um, you know, my, my uncle actually didn't have to serve in World War II because he, by that time, I, I think he had three children. So he was exempt. He was in the service before. Uh, and when he came back, that's when he married my aunt. But again, he didn't have to serve. So that was, that was pretty interesting to know also. Yeah, that is, that is interesting. I didn't know they gave, uh, they gave exemptions during, during the war when people had that many kids. That's, yeah. Because, you know, I, I thought it was like how America was where they were just drafting people left and right into the uh, the war and just not taking into account whether or not, you know, the father was going to end up leaving his children without a, without a dad and if he were to pass away in war or not. So that's, that's a little uh, different to, to hear and to read and come across. Yeah. And in fact, I learned recently that if you had, um, I think it was the third child, if you were if you were away, like let's say uh, this person was in Albania, they um, if you had that third child, they would actually send you back home. Oh wow, that's actually really interesting. So you could have had two, but your wife was so many months pregnant. You went, you got sent off to war, and then you got called back. Wow, did that happen to anyone in like your family uh, in particular? Did you just come across that through? coming across your research on your family. Not that I know of. This came across with an interview that I did with somebody else who, who told me that. Is, is the interview on the, the blog? The, yes, it is. It was, I think, the last one that I did. Let's talk about uh, talk about your, your dad's side of the family again. And uh, you mentioned that, you know, his male line, Sorrentano, they were, they were a gentrified family. Um, and like you said, they were lawyers and uh, pharmacists. Can you... Uh, Give us a little uh, discussion or little interesting tidbits that you found along your way about that family when you performed the research on them. Yeah, sure. So I was having the toughest time finding the Sorrentino side. Um, I, I just had a roadblock. And I eventually hired somebody in Italy to help me do the research. And um, the interesting part of that story, again, I'm a firm believer in fate and karma. I hadn't heard. He had sent me some stuff on my grandmother's family. Nothing on my father's family. About a year went by. I hadn't heard anything. And in fact, I was just going to go back and say, hey, what happened? And uh, my cousin who lived with my grandparents passed away. And she was kind of my go-to person with some of the research. And two days later, I got this data dump from Italy with the Sorrentino family. Coincidence? Maybe. <laughs> I don't think so. That's when I found out that um, they were lawyers. And uh, there was one record that he passed me, which was, I, I, it wasn't a wedding vow or bands per se. It seemed to be like a, almost like a, a contract or 
a sort of a prenup that was like 34 pages long because her father was a lawyer. He had everything in this thing from the kitchen sink, even strange things like he was never in the army. Why that made a difference, I have no idea. So that was very, very interesting to find. With my grandmother's side, her mother and father, I did have some records. He sent me some more and was able to confirm what I thought I knew. And also with the help of some of the cousins that I found over there, I was able to put a piece, to piece together a pretty good picture of, of that family, the Piramalo and the Crotchalo family. And um, I always tell people that you can't give up. You'll find the most, the strangest things in the strangest places. And when I first put in my great-grandfather's name, Nicola Piramalo, what popped up was a record from the Libro de Oro, de Oro for Crotchalo. I had never heard that name before. And that's when I went to my cousin Louise. And I said, have you heard this name? And she says, of course, that was grandma's mother. I said, did you know how famous they were? She said, oh, she used to tell us that her cousin was the princess, but we just thought she was a batty old lady and didn't. But it was true. <laughs> she was the princess. <laughs> oh, that's, I mean, it's, it's, such a, it's such a lovely, like, story that you're able to actually connect the dots fully and, like, even connect with your family back in Italy. You know, after, uh, after so many years of having the suspicion. Well, yeah, and I never knew these people existed. I never knew anybody was there. No one ever really talked about the family in Italy. I bet, like, that was kind of, like, shocking when you first, like, came across them. But at the same time, it was like, you, you know, you had to know someone was there, but you just, you never know who they necessarily are, you know? Well, yeah, and the only thing, the only inkling of having family there that I knew was my dad told me, oh, probably, I don't know, 30, 35 years ago. Um, that he had family in Torre del Greco. Never said who, never said anything. And two months before we left on the trip, I got contacted by um, my dad's first cousin, who's actually younger than me. That's a whole story in the book in itself. And um, he said, you're coming. I'm going to meet you at the cemetery. And I'm going to take you to my... Uh, they, my cousin, my aunt's house. They were my father's first cousins. Never knew, never had an idea. That's that's awesome, especially because like the whole situation with him being a, a younger first cousin just makes it like a younger first cousin of your father's just makes it all the more interesting. Um, I see you put the uh, the calling card up on, on on the screen. This was the the card that you received from your your grandmother, right? That's what started everything, yes. Yeah. My grandmother brought this card from Italy, you know, when she came in, I guess, 1915 or something like that. In fact, I, I think she brought a whole box of them uh, because my cousins have some. And, yeah, that's what pretty much started it all. But I just wanted to flip to my dad's family in Torre del Greco. The, the woman in the center is my father's first cousin from my grandmother's youngest brother. And she bears a, you know... Pretty good resemblance to my grandmother. You know, I was not an exact match, but pretty good resemblance. That had to be a uh, like almost like a, a wild like blast from the past, or like a, a deja uh, use of sort. You know, you know what I mean? Like looking at her and remembering how your grandmother looked and seeing how similar they they look. Well, yeah, and and the, the crazy part of it is they started taking out pictures. They they took out my parents' um, wedding picture with my grandmother's handwriting on the back of the photo just blew me away. And again, that's why I tell people, you know, it's great if you're planning a trip to Italy. If you um, go to Rome, you go to Florence, you go to all of those places. It's, it's, it's a wonderful trip and everything. But if you have any idea where your family is from and you go to that town, I've heard, so many, I, I've heard stories where people will be in this town and they would either mention their name or they would see somebody that looked like their grandfather or their uncle, and they would say something. They would say, "Oh, sure, we we know who that is," and they would bring them. They bring them to their houses. They, it's incredible. It's just too hard to explain unless you actually do it. It sounds 
amazing because it sounds so like homely and, and personal, you know, personal that as opposed to like going to these major cities that are tourist areas, you just kind of feel like a, another number. You know, what I, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're just, you're just, you know, tourist number 10 or whatever that came through the building this day, you know, as opposed to being, you know, the grandson of so-and-so or the great grandson of so-and-so and the people having some sort of memory of this person in their town. Well, yeah, exactly. And especially when you meet your family and they have photos and, and everything. And um, right after we got back, a little while after we got back, Nicola sent me uh, photographs that my grandmother sent 100 years ago to her father that his mother actually saved. Uh, and that's the back cover of the book. Again, it's too hard to believe. And we originally were supposed to go on the trip. Yeah, that's it. We were originally supposed to go on the trip, you know, two and a half years ago. And had we gone at that time, you know, COVID had hit. We had to postpone it a couple of times. I never would have met Nicola, never would have met the family, never would have known any of this. So things happen and for strange reasons and strange ways. I absolutely agree that things, you know, they always happen for a reason, and for whatever that reason is, it's it's always to you know, it it, it always works out for the best. You you know what I mean? Like so, the fact that yeah, sure, it was you know not the greatest that you had to wait two and a half years to go back to Italy, but and on the bright side of things, like you said, you wouldn't have met these family members and been able to have this interaction with them back in Italy. Um, now, you mentioned the Carciolo family and the uh, Piramalo family. What other noble families do you uh, descend from? Uh, you know, maybe ones that we might particularly know through pop culture, like, say, like the, the television show The Borgias, or, um, or even, uh, I'm trying to think of other uh, shows that depict, uh, oh, the, the De Medici's, um, that show, that was, yeah. That was the other show I was thinking of. Uh, the show with Leonardo, and as well as the show with Leonardo da Vinci that covers the Medici's and into the Borgias as well. Do you are are you related to any family like that or? Yeah, and and um, I but there's probably about thirty or thirty five families that I go through in the book, and that was another reason why I wanted to do this because we've heard so much throughout the years, and, and there's shows about the the British royal family and the Spanish royal families and the French royal families, uh, noble families, but not much about the Italians. And um, there's a rich history for a thousand years of Italian nobility, Italian royalty, um, you know, the, how the kingdoms were all split up. And uh, one family in particular that I had never really known about was, uh, and they're Crest is on the screen now, the D'Este family. I had never heard of Isabella D'Este. And she was married to Francesco Gonzaga, who was, uh, and this is highlighted in the Borgias, he was the um, lover of, or one of the lovers of Lucretia Borgia. And um, they didn't treat her very nicely on that show. They didn't treat her good at all, uh, unfortunately. But I refer to her, she was like the Jackie Kennedy of of the Renaissance. She was into all the arts. Um, she had all of these, you know, the famous painters come. And um, it was, it, her story is just incredible. And in fact, she was so good that when her husband was off either fooling around with Lucretio or fighting a war someplace, she was running um, the, um, uh, the, the duchy. Um, and, uh, you know, a very, I mean, a very beautiful woman, but also very intelligent and, uh, you know, quite, quite a real person. Um, some of the other families that uh, are in the book are the Colonas, you know, very fam famous family, Orsini's, again, another family, the Lascalas, uh, you know, another big family. The Aragonas, who were Spanish, they, and I put them in there, not because um, they were Spanish or anything else or not Italian, but because they were so prominent in Naples 
for so many years. And they're mentioned a lot in the Borgias. And um, there's quite an interesting story about uh, King Ferrante um, that's in the book. And it's also in the Borgias. Uh, he was uh, he was quite a guy. He believed in keeping his enemies close. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's not spoil it for the the readers or anyone that is uh, interested in watching the the Borgia show. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's a uh, very uh, it's a very interesting way to uh, to treat your enemies uh, after uh, <laughs> after they I guess we'll say expired. Um, I, I wanted to walk it back a bit to what we were discussing the the De Este family. Um, where do they uh? Do you know where they originate from? Um, in terms well, of yeah, they were they were from the north. Um, I, I get my towns confused. I I don't remember if she was Mantua before she was married to Gonzago when, but they were both the Gonzagas Gonzagas and the Dieste families were very prominent in the north. The, the reason why is because I I've never seen their uh, like a page or a link for them on the. Uh, Nobili, no, Nobili Napolitano, which you know highlights all a lot of the, the noble families in the south. So I was just uh, just interested on in where they they came from, and I'm sure that others you know that are fans of the, the show, the Borgias, or if they're going to watch the show, they might want a little uh, background information as well as anyone interested in uh, purchasing the uh, the book. Do you have any interesting um, stories? on any of these families in particular that you would like to share outside of um, the, uh, the story you shared earlier about the uh, Dieste woman? There's so many. I think, I think the important thing to know is that there were so many of these families, whether they were you know, very, very high-class nobility like the Caracciolos uh, or Dieste or Gonzaga um, or some of the, you know, the less known ones that you know, owned the town, but there was just so much infighting among these areas in Italy. Uh, it, it was not a stable place for hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, you know who was who was poisoning who, and who was murdering the other one, and, and you know who was buying this town, and you know all of these intermarriages. Uh, it's it's quite an interesting story because unlike I think. England and France, these duchies and counties and uh, marquisates, they weren't stable. I'm sure their their instability contributed to, like you said, all of the aforementioned things, the wars, the intrigue, and, and stuff like and stuff like that. Um, and, and then now, and then throw the Pope in there too. Yeah, and it's even it's even more confusing. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, because then the Pope. You know, because he, you know, someone, the Pope likes this individual's family more. He recognizes yeah. this individual's claim more than another's claim. That's what the whole uh, Great Italian War saga was over. It was um, one king, it was the Spanish king after taking, sorry, the French king after the Spanish took Naples, wanted to retake Naples for, for his domain. And I think it was the Borgia Pope. So at first sided with the French and then turned his back and sided with the Spanish or something like that. And it, it created like a whole, like just big mess of problems that lasted for like 80 years or something like that. It, you know, the great Italian wars went from like the 1490s to like the, almost the 1570s. So, I mean, wow, quite a little uh, mix up the, uh, you know, mix the Pope in it. It, it, it creates a lot of uh, drama, I should say. Um, Italy recently. Can can you give us a little bit of a rundown on how that experience was for you? Yeah, sure. It was um, certainly a trip of a lifetime. We had um, contracted with uh, Letizia Sanisi from Italy Rooting, who did just a fantastic job in setting the whole trip up. And it was kind of pretty much of a whirlwind because we hit three, uh, I'm sorry, five regions. Um, we were planning on six, but we had to put pull you off for a while. But every place was was different, and we went to uh, ancestral homes in Molise and um, Avellino and Calabria, 
and then also my wife's mom is from Shaka, so we, we visited Sicily too. Um, and uh, it was just incredible experience, mainly because of the people. The people really, really appreciate us going back there to our hometowns and uh, wanting to be part of the culture. Their history is so rich, it's, they don't forget anything. Uh, that was one of the amazing things. When we went to the, the picture behind me, uh, the Palazzo and Avellino, I asked them, I, I said, why do they hold these Caracciolo families in such reverence, the, the princes going back to you know, 1600, 1700? And they explained to me that they were good to the people, that they brought industry, they helped them with the land. They, for the most part, there was, you know, of course there were bad nobles too, but for the most part, they were the government, they were the people that did everything, I guess, from justice to industry to farming to you name it. And um, they still revere these people. And it was incredible to me. I, it was like, when we walked through the through that little door there, um, there were people in costumes, and they were. We walk in, and they were blowing the trumpet like you know the queen was coming or something. It was like I'm standing there like a doofus trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I, I I take it you had you had a great time on your trip, and and like you said, uh, your favorite part of the trip was going to these individual towns and, and interacting with these uh, with with the people your family as well as you know the people from the the area um is this what motivated you to write this book or did you have motivation to write the book prior to your trip to Italy I did I had the motivation to to do it before the trip um and in fact I was almost gonna I was almost positive we weren't ever gonna make this trip uh but we did and so I had a, I held off to finishing the book until we got back but yeah, I was always in my mind to do it for a couple of reasons. One is I want to have people see what I've done so that they do the same thing, specifically when it comes to whether it's your Italian-American family here with stories or uh, stories from Italy or finding the family in Italy. Um, this, the second reason is some of the stories that I've heard from, from my interviews are just so incredible how things happen, how things just kind of pop up. And then finally, there's a little bit of a primer in there at the back of the book, just kind of explaining how to navigate the Antonati and some, some links to use to find your Italian family. What was your then, motive to write the book outside of people wanting to uh, you know, potentially do the, the same thing? Did, did you feel like it was necessary for you to like, put out your story because it was so unique in particular? I wouldn't say because it was so unique in particular. Uh, I, I think it was more from, from, from the noble side of the family to get people to be in touch with the rich. I, I, like, I love history. So they have people get in touch with the rich history of Italy outside of the stupid stuff we see on TV all the time. Yeah, I, I, I totally... Uh... I totally understand where you're where you're coming from with that, especially considering that uh, you know a lot of times in pop culture, Italy Italians and Italy in general is not depicted in the greatest light. I would say you know um, especially you know with like you know people making fun of Italians with you know the hand gestures and, and being dramatic. So it, it, it's a it's a good thing to you know spread a positive image about the uh the Italian culture. Now are are you working on anything else? Any like projects, books or any you know with any organizations to better the Italian American community? Nothing in particular with the Italian American community per se. Yeah, I was hoping to do something with my friend Anthony who passed away last January. Um and he's he's got a fantastic book out. Um about uh, all the interviews he did back in the 70s. As you know, you and I are working on a book about Calabrian nobles and, and those some 130 families, noble families just in Calabria alone. 
yeah, it's it's a lot of families to go through, and stories so far have been have been very uh very very interesting, and uh a lot of them have been in depth. A lot, of, a lot of these families have a lot of history and records kept on them. You know, I, I don't want to spoil uh, too much for the, you know, the the viewers out there, but I mean, it, it goes back from the Roman times all the way to the the Bourbons. So that's a, that's like eighteen hundred and fifty years of history. Well, yeah, and and um, another good book, although it's just in Italian right now, is from. Um, Nicola Mastronati, who we met there, and he's an expert on the Samnite Nation. Again, I had never heard of these people, and I, I heard about it before, but then they took us to the ruins over there. And um, they predated the Romans and actually fought the Romans for years and years and years. Uh, it's quite an interesting story. And, you know, he, he said, I asked him, why are you interested in this? And he said, well, you know, my family's been here for a thousand years or more, so they're my, you know, they're my history. Um, so good, that's very interesting when you start digging into even before the Europe, the rest of Europe got there, when the Romans got there, there were these very, very intelligent tribes, warrior tribes that were in Italy going back to 3000 BC. Yeah, because before the Romans in the north, there was the Etruscans and the Samurai, if I recall correctly from learning in uh, history classes, they were um, mainly uh, located in like the Campania, uh, Caserta, and just like to the east of the the northern portion of southern Italy. Yeah, they, they stretch from like um, the upper part of Calabria up through uh, Puglia and Molise and, and, and then there's not quite into Rome, but again, the Romans wanted their territory, so that's what that's what caused all the infighting. Yeah, I believe they had like a, a couple wars with the Romans, right? Yeah, it's very interesting, uh, very interesting stuff because I know that to the south, the Romans used to call it uh, Magna Grecia, which stands for Greater Greece, um, because of how much the Greek colonization really shaped the south of Italy. Exactly. I just put up a little bit of a, an eye chart there, which is, um, I, I want to put this up there more, well, for a couple of reasons. One is, it's a great chart that was done by um, Kai White, who's a um, West Point graduate and an expert on um, the Crusades. He's wrote several books about the Crusades, and he also makes these fantastic charts and um, I just wanted to say that I get asked all the time a couple of things. One is, well, everybody says they're from nobility, and how do you know? Um, the second thing is everybody's related to nobility, uh, which is true. Everybody is. Pretty much everybody alive today has, could you know, probably trace their, their path back. But it's hard to find. It's hard to figure out. If you're from English descent or Scottish descent or Irish descent in America, it's not so hard because the documentation is so good. And if you could trace yourself back to a, uh, to a, a gateway ancestor, um, you could find your way back to most of the nobility or royal families in England. It's really not that difficult. When I approached Kai and I said, these are my Coachello ancestors, can you do a chart for me? He said, well, I don't know. I'll have to check. And he came back, and once he found out, um, one of my great-great-great-grandfathers, Ambrosio, Caracciolo, he said, yeah, I could, I could do the chart. You know, the thing is, when you're doing your research, don't take anything for granted, first of all. Second of all, look for obscure things, because you never know what you're going to find. Um, and then finally... Go to the hometowns. A lot of them have Facebook pages, or if you have a, a name, um, go out to that hometown, search on the name. You'll never know, you know who you're going to pick up on. And even in the United States, I was able to go back to newspapers in um, New Jersey back in the 20s, and I found things about Italy in those papers from my family. Somebody passed away, and it was in the paper in New Jersey.
that's extremely wild. Uh, you have that in the book, right? You included that in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember seeing that when I went through the book. I, I forgot to ask you a question on that when we were when we were discussing, you know, more so the contents of the book. You stated that uh, that almost everyone has uh, European nobility ancestry, but it's it's very tough to uh, to find the, the find the connection, uh, unless if you know you know for particularly for Italian Americans, it's harder because we don't have the the records going back so long in America to a gateway ancestor in England. So, what do you, what do you suggest? Do you suggest looking back through um, the Avenatti and I can't remember the other uh, the other thing that was like the town records. Well, yeah, the Antonati. I mean, you know, church records are, are tough to to get, but uh, for people who think they may have nobility, and, uh, and of course, we know that you have some too, but is go to Nobility of Naples uh, website and the Libro di Oro. And if you can find the connection there, um, if it just opens up a, you know, a whole world that you would, you would never know. I've talked to people who have been able to find that. Again, similar to me, they may have had an artifact. They may have had um, a letter or they may have found something in a Bible with a name and they started their research and they were able to, to find it. One thing that I do caution people about is when you search these places online that, you know, say, send us your name and we'll send you a coat of arms, it's baloney, so don't do that. Yeah, they're just in the business of, uh, of making money. They're not, they're not really in the business of performing any sort of accurate um, genealogical research. Uh, yeah, if anybody has a question, you could just put a comment on, and I could put it up there on the screen. Okay. Well, I, I had a I had a, a question I'm, I didn't ask during uh, during our our interview because I wanted to wait and save it. Um, I noticed that you uh, you're when you were discussing the the family that got your Sorrentino line that married the uh, lawyer and the the, the lengthy marriage contract. They married to the Longo. She was her last yeah. name was Longo. Is that um, potentially the Longo family that was um, like lower nobility in the Naples region? Possible, but again, I haven't been able to make that connection. So I never jump to conclusions. You know, yeah. I, I really want to have the, the hard evidence. And, um, you know, I was, I was lucky in respect to the Piermalo family that I was able to find my great grandfather's birth record and his father's record uh, going back. Yeah, right. this is just a little post from Ben Lariccia. You know, not every surname has a coat of arms, so beware of those vendors in the mail for sure. And uh, technically, technically, the the coat of arms really only belongs to one person. It's not necessarily, you know, the whole family. Who, who has it. It's really the heir to that particular title that really gets to use it. In my grandfather's case, my great-grandfather's case, it says uh, from the Dukes of Capricota. So it doesn't say that he's got any titles or anything like that. Yeah, and some uh, grants, when the uh, king would grant the titles, they would be only for the uh, primogenitor. Um, so it would go only to the firstborn male. Sometimes the coat of arms would be granted to the whole, uh, to any heirs of the That's uh, right. yeah. individual. So then the entire family was able to um, use it. Yeah, that's right. That's a, and that's a good point. And I've come across um, a couple of those in the family. That every, it says in perpetuity, everybody who has that name can use that title. Phil, do you, do you know about any the nobility in Piemonte? I do not know about any of the uh, nobility in Piemonte. I would say that probably the uh, the best way of going about um, like searching for the nobility in Piemonte would be uh, just go into a, a, a Google search, and I, I would start off with just typing "nobility of Piemonte" in quotations, and then work from work from there um yeah oh that yeah you could type in uh your the surname 
Di Pinamonte, and if there is the family was like notable, stuff will start popping up. Like, say for instance, my family is Capani. When I typed in Capani di Zagaris, I got a, a couple of web pages that popped up. I got something that popped up about a um, prosecutor from like the 1580s. Another uh, page about um, a uh, I think it was lieutenant or it was like um like a military officer or something like that i'm not i'm not too sure exactly but it, when it translated to english it said lieutenant um in the 1600s living in zagadis and then i found a mayor um from records in the same in the 1700s and then a notary in the 1800s when I, just by typing in the last name and then the area from there right and also you know go to the libro de oro because they have uh, all the noble families from Italy on there. Not they don't have the tree for everybody, but it's quite possible it's there. Yeah, and even if they don't have the tree, they'll have some sort of a summary about the family and their their origins. Whether it's the first person that obtained the title, or it's where the family transplanted from. Um, whether it's from like how Bob's family, the Piramalos, came from Spain in the uh, 1500s when the Spanish empire was controlling the south of Italy. Yeah, and those and, and that goes back. I found the Caracciolo ancestors back in the 950 on there. It was just kept going back and back and back. I, I consider myself extremely, extremely lucky that my grandmother brought that card from Italy because I never would have, I never would have had a clue as to any of this. Uh, so, Again, you know, go through all the old artifacts, old letters, even if there's a story that you don't believe, you know, see if you can follow up on it. That was exactly uh, my case. I, I didn't, I didn't believe my grandmother at all um, when she when she told me that her family were uh, were nobles and like the like you know both sides of the families were nobles. I I, I didn't I didn't believe it at all. Um, just because like. I don't live in, you know, some super wealthy, crazy mansion or, or anything like that. So I, I was like, no, no way, Grandma. Like, this this can't be true. But, you know, as I kept, you know, when, once I actually started doing the family tree and then I got back about, like, three generations and I started, you know, finding things like, oh, this guy was a, a doctor or this guy was a lawyer, mayor of a town, you know, like. And then, you know, you start doing more and more research, you keep going back more and more, and it, it starts leading you to larger nobles, and then even, you know, larger and larger nobility as as you keep going down the line. Or sometimes families would ascend, too, which that, that was a lot harder to do during the days of feudalism than, you know, than it, than it is now. That's, that's what, it was the American dream, like, you know, all of our Italian ancestors, you know, for us Italian Americans came here as well as you know other parts of the world was to you know really you know better yourself and, and your kids right and and phil and i do have a facebook group um dedicated to descendants of italian nobility so you could always go on that facebook facebook group and ask us or ask somebody else in the group i think there's about 250 people in the group right now so that's certainly a good place to start too yeah, I, I actually believe that there's a, a few, I, I don't want to say 100%, um, but I believe there's a few nobles from Northern Italy in, in the group, right, Bob? I think so, yeah, I think so. So they would be w way better people to ask um, about anything to do with the North than, than Bob or I, because both of our families are from the South. I know Bob has some uh, family that, you know, came from the north and to the south more recently than than my family did. So, um, but we're, both of our families really come from the south. That's where our, our roots are. I mean, that's where they migrated from uh, Italy to America. Yeah, and and then you know another interesting fact about the the southern Italians was that the nobles all lived in Naples. I thought they lived where they. The, their towns, but they didn't. They would go visit there once or twice a year. Um, but they spent their they spent their lives in Naples and yeah. collected taxes. Collected taxes. That's what they did for a living. They collected taxes. 
<laughs> they, they they would go they would go to their their demands to collect their their taxes, and then they would go back to their most. A lot of them would live in if they didn't live in Palacios in Naples, they lived in um, apartments inside of these Palacios because you know these Palacios are so massive. They got twenty rooms in them, so they might own a section of it where it's like five bedrooms. And you know, as recent as the the um, mid eighteen hundreds. My grandmother's Piramalo family, they had at least six palazzos that I know of. So, so they, I just recently, my cousin Chinsia found one in Messina, where, where her great-great-grandfather was born. Uh, so these people, they were very wealthy. Uh, unfortunately, we ain't. <laughs> 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 yeah, very, very unfortunate. You know, um, but hey. But what does you like to at least drop in once in a while and look, yeah. look from the sky and see how they live? That would be very interesting. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, now you were unable to visit the uh, the Palacio and Messina because she didn't discover it yet until after after you left, right? Yeah, we were three blocks away at the waiting. We were at the ferry. Pier, three blocks away, and I didn't know it was there. Yeah. Oh man, that that reminds me of um from our a prior discussion we've had. I don't know if we if this was on one of the blog posts or if it was just when we got together and discussed it. Uh, you told me about how last time you were in Italy before the most recent time this year, uh, you were like two blocks away from where all your Carcholo ancestors lived, and you didn't even know it. You didn't even know that they were your ancestors and that there was their place and all those things. So it was like another one of those experiences for you. Now you have a, a, another reason to head back to Italy because you have some more things to visit. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, where I'm working with Letizia to see if we could come up with some kind of way so that for people who may not know the hometowns that they're from, they may know they're from Calabria or Sicily, is to try and come up with a way to um, to have a trip that brings you back in time, similar to what I did, um, so that you could experience just the, I, you know, I can't say it enough, the wonderful, lovely people there who are so excited to see us. Uh, well, that, Greg, that's a good question. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you two things. Um, the people in Avellino were the ones that told me when I asked, why do they still celebrate um, these nobles. And they're the ones who explained to me that they were good to the people. They brought industry. They brought farming. Um, they celebrated with them. They, they built the churches. They upkept the churches. They spent, most of them spent a lot of money. Um, I think for the most part, it was the rule. Uh, but there were some you know, especially in my family, there were some pretty cool, cool ones if you go through the list. Um, but I'll tell you one story that they told me when we were there. And it was one of the Piramalo homes in Massa di Soma uh, that they said I had to see. And we got there and I had the crest and all of that. And they brought us into this courtyard and they said, look up at the second floor balcony. And I said, okay. And they said, the, uh, the, the, I guess he was the, uh, I think he was a count. He was a count. Uh, he, on his birthday, he would roast the pig. He would hand out wine and get the people drunk and then throw money out the window for sport to watch them fight. <laughs> not, not one of the more pleasant stories that you want to hear about your third great grandfather, but, you know, so that's an instance of where maybe he wasn't so nice all the time. It's not a uh, a flattering story, but you know it. You know history isn't always flattering, and neither is family history. So you know it, you take the good with the bad. But a, as for a, a rule of being a, a a part of being noble was like treating those that were the um, lesser class with humility and respect it's about you know it was about being kind and 
being like noble in your being and that's that's really what like a lot of nobles aim to be like but you know of, of course a, a lot of history is recorded about you know whether it's an ex on the extreme end of someone being very good or, or very bad a lot of people have fell in between there they weren't really you know left in for you know the history books to record and there's a reason why is because they were just kind of you know going with the status quo yeah, and when we were leaving Avellino, I, I said to Letizia, I said, that was pretty amazing. And she said, if you think they treated you like royalty in Avellino, wait until you get to Montebello, they're going to treat you like God. And they did. They, the, the people were just amazing. And um, they, they I, you know, I said it before, they have this rich history that they're not going to let go by the wayside. They just won't. The churches in the smallest towns are immaculate, beautiful, well-kept flowers. When we were in um, the square of Montebello and they were you know, doing some entertaining and you know singing and dancing and things, and the florist came out from the, there was a florist shop in the, the town and he gave my wife a bouquet of roses painted in the colors of the Pure Malo uh, coat of arms, blue and gold. And I said to Letizia, I said, boy, that was so nice. And she said, that wasn't part of the plan. He just heard that you were here from America and you were descendant from the Pure Malo family and he wanted to do that. And, they was, and these weren't, this wasn't a cheap bouquet of flowers either. These were beautiful roses. But that's just the way they are. Just the way they are. It's absolutely, it's absolutely beautiful that you know he did that um, for your your wife, and he took the time to arrange it in the color of your family's crest. Like wow, like yeah. You know, I, honestly, like you know, I my I, I'm from like a smaller town in America, and like as my town grew, um, you know, it, the community kind of like. The community feel kind of dissipated a bit and that's like something like when i first moved in to my my hometown like that's something like that happened when the town was like five six thousand people big you know and and you know it's not just because you're from a noble family they they do it for everybody i'll tell you you know one quick story just from an interview the the last interview i did um with robert fumo he He's been to Italy like some 30 times, and he's from a, um, a small town, Coliano. And he was there, and he was in a bar, and he saw a um, gentleman, older gentleman, drinking a spritz, and he had never seen it before because it's like an orangey color. So he asked an Italian, you know, what's that? And the, the uh, person thought he was asking what – he was asking about the drink, but the person thought he was asking about the um, – uh, about the person. So he said, well, that's uh, Ernesto Fumo. He says, well, I'm Fumo. So he said, I went over to him and I said, I'm Roberto Fumo. And he said, I know, I'm your uncle. <laughs> just like that. And he said he just kept playing his cards like it was nothing. Um, and then he said, his next trip over, he actually got to spend some time with him. And that's just, that's just the way they are. It was just so much, yeah, I know who you are. You're, I'm your uncle. Uh, you gotta love that. So, like, from what what I took away from you know your discussion about your trip to Italy is from our you know our prior discussion and as well as today is you know you really like more of the the small town atmosphere a lot better because people are very um, very warm and uh, considerate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if and if they know you come from that town. You're like gold. You're you're one of them, right? <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, you are. You are. Oh, we got another question. I didn't see this question come up. Yeah, I got one more. Just popped up. Were the mayors of the the commune usually from nobility? From what I researched from my family's hometown, that was kind of the case until like more recent history. But from like. The records I obtained from, I'm trying to think, like, I think it was, like, 1720, 
to the 1890s. Uh, yeah, pretty much any uh, family that held the title of mayor came from family that owned land and, you know, they were titled Don and, or, you know, were cons their families are listed on nobility, not Quitani and or, or whatnot. So that that's at least from what I've seen. But I, I wouldn't think that that's always necessarily the rule, especially when you, once you get to larger towns, because, you know, there's merchants and, and more of a middle class in, in, in those type of areas. Uh, yeah, that's kind of been my experience too, and I, I think um, it, there weren't necessary elections back then too. If there was, you know, a mayor of the of the, the town or or um, something, they would have been appointed probably by by a noble um, from from maybe a lesser noble family or, like you said, a merchant or something like that. Uh, it was a very extremely closed society. From, from what I've read and from what I understand. Yeah, yeah, same here. Um, you know, if you were like a merchant you and you, you were appointed the position, it's because you had connections with the uh, the nobleman that had the, um, the control of that particular fiefdom. Uh, so, you know, you were able to then get in a good position. Or you had money. Of course, not, you know, it's, you know, a lot of nobles had started getting watered down and they didn't have money anymore. They had the title, they owned the town, but they didn't necessarily have a lot of money. So they started having to depend on these merchants. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, that, that was around, that started really like becoming a thing in the late 1700s, early 1800s. I, I have one concern. I'd like to know what happened to all the jewelry, but other than that, I... oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Spe especially the jewelry, out of all things to uh, to part with, because they're so like it's so personal, you know. Because it's like it, it could be fit on to your uh, your person, you know what I mean? Like whether it's your necklace, uh, a watch, um, a bracelet, a ring, earrings. Oh, so one last thing before we go. I just need to mention this. If um, if you want to purchase the book, let me just put that up there. Um, it could be found on my site uh, at www.italiangenealogy.blog, farmers hyphen and nobles, or it's on Amazon in, in Janu January. And special thanks to uh, Sandra Skidmore, uh, from January Publishing, who you know took the chance and published the book for me. So, and Phil's holding it up there. I, I'm I'm Vanna White right here. So, yeah. <laughs> I oh, don't I, see any other questions. Oh, uh, I, someone just said that they're gonna they're gonna join the the Facebook page. So that that's a good thing. And my sister said, my sister said this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so especially especially your sister. I'm sure she would have loved it. Thank you all for, for coming out and, um, you know, enjoying your Sunday with, with us. Oh, no, th thank you. Thank you for it. Thank, thank you so much. We, we greatly appreciate it. Bob and I yeah. love to uh, talk about these types of things. Yeah, we could go probably another three hours, but we don't want to bore everybody to death. So, well, thanks, <laughs> Phil. I appreciate you doing this. Well, thank you, Bob. Thank you for having me on. All right. Talk to you later.